Well, let's talk about some of the successes then. I mean, we want to instill in people a recognition that some of the attributes of that culture are still very much with us today. And what would you tell people to convince them that the phenomenon has a lasting impact that we're feeling today? I think the tricky thing about the Summer of Love is that it didn't work on the usual registers by which we talk about how change recovery, continuity happen in history. So it's not like an election where someone got, you know, the political power changes. This is a kind of force that moves maybe person to person or it moves through, um, it kind of sneaks its way through on something like rock music within the system, you know, basically something you could buy and sell and make, you know, part of the profit system, but then it's also got these other kind of information and messages in it. Right, cultural influence. Cultural yeah. influence, kind of whispers below the, <laughs> whispers all kinds of things. And even the U.S. military. I mean, we, you know, most of the counterculture was um, explicitly against the Vietnam War or generally anti-war, and a part of the peace movement writ large. And yet it's the U.S. military that ironically carries the message over to Vietnam as much as any, anyone else does. So, so I think that one thing, as a historian, one of the things that the counterculture of the 60s and the summer of love can teach us 50 years later is that we might widen our lens on how change happens and the vehicles for that change. And maybe not get bogged down in the immediacy of the micro, is this working right now, but just do it because over time you might see more effects than you expected. And also to keep trying to think hard about how it all fits together, right? How does the culture fit with the politics? How do things go in one direction or another as they move from one part of society to another? I mean, we just have this amazing um, uh, uh, um, set of stories from the 1960s that can help us try to make sense of what's going on now um, and what happens in the future. Mm. It brought us all here today, yes. literally this melting pot of people who recognize that there's some value to be examined from that whole period. Definitely. And I think, I mean, that's what drew me to this conference is that I, I you know, I, I'm always intrigued by the vision, just the ability to kind of imagine something different, because I think oftentimes we're not even able to see or think beyond the ceilings that are put on our head of what we think is possible under capitalism, under imperialism, under the American way. Um, we're supposed to want the American dream, but what about alternatives? And I'm always attracted to uh, movements that are trying to have a utopian vision in a way, who are willing to dream, even if the dreams are flawed, um, even if they're problematic. Um, I'm interested in that because I feel like that's what my Black Panthers and Black Power activists were also trying to do. I want to take advantage of the fact that you are living in Europe, now you're in France, and get that global perspective, that European perspective. You teach about American civilization, about these concepts. What's the reaction of the European students over there? To, like, current events? You no, mean, no, no, to, to, to what we're talking, to the oh, 60s, yeah. to counterculture. Well, it's varied, you know? Sure. And, I mean, part of it is that students now, for students now, the summer of love, Right, talking about the 1960s is ancient history. It's like, yeah, there's like very, their yeah. only relationship to it is through popular culture. Yeah. Right? Is it a cool, fascinating thing or a waste of our time? Why are we looking at that? Yeah. No, it is a cool, fascinating thing. Okay. And they're really interested in it. They're really interested in American popular culture, for yeah. one thing, right? They're, that's kind of their starting point, And it's often the main reason that they're interested in taking my classes is because they think they're going to learn more about American popular culture. So you attract that. <laughs> yeah, sure. And then the other thing is that they're really interested in the Vietnam War, right? And that's partly also, I think, because of popular culture, because they've seen it in films and on television and things like that. But it's also because they are bewildered by American foreign policy today 
They can't understand why the United States under several administrations has done the things that it's done. And so they have a kind of basic sense that all of this weirdness about American foreign policy began with Vietnam, right? Because they can talk to their parents or grandparents who are more celebratory about the United States because of its role in the Second World War and in liberating Europe and things like that. But then it's like, so how do we get from that, from that United States that liberated Europe to put war criminals on trial to a nation that seems to be run by war criminals, right? Like, how did that happen? And so they're often very interested in the Vietnam War for that reason. Like, they have a pretty accurate sense that that's kind of where it turned. And so does that, do you feel, give them a, a kindred connection or a, a deeper appreciation for that counterculture and the resistance? And do they Absolutely. sort of agree with that resistance <laughs> yeah absolutely yeah because and and also for their own you know in their own culture um which has its own dark history of colonialism and things like that and colonial wars and has also you know right-wing politicians uh, beating the drums of hate and uh being scared of refugees making people feel scared of refugees and things like that so they they're interested in the tools or the models that are provided by, say, the counterculture or punks or, you know, more mainstream social movement activism and things like that. Like they're looking for, like most young people that I've encountered in years of university teaching, they're kind of looking for a toolkit, right, that they can draw upon to wage their own protests and build their own cultures of resistance. And so for that, you know, I'd like to think as a historian, history is a good place to go. You did a lot of research for your book. You're an historian and have studied the period as well. What kind of things really surprised you that you didn't expect, given what you thought you knew about the period? <laughs> right. Well, I think the biggest thing for me that I think about now is we, we, tend to, we tend to get, we still have this kind of way that we think about how the counterculture came from outside mainstream America. Like, it was authentic and separate and pure. And what I noticed in my research was just how much the counterculture kind of arose within the mainstream culture. You know, it, rock music was a commercial form of music. Yeah. You know, um, Vietnam was, you know, there may have been rock music there, but this was an imperial war yeah. <laughs> waged by the United States. And yet, to me, what the counterculture was were like these little eddies of questioning, of rethinking, in which people took what they had and sort of tried to turn it in a counter direction. Um, and I think that's, again, something I learned from the time that I was surprised by that is relevant today. You know, it's not about who's the purest and who's the most outside, and it's about, it's pragmatic, not utopian. It's how can we use the things that are in the world around us to turn the world another way? a better way. That, that's where I found the value. I guess what you're helping me realize and what I realize, well, what you're helping me realize now is that there are so many different things that influenced the world that originated here. We're, we've been such a beacon historically for people to come and check this out and find some wisdom here and, and participate in some culture that we're doing, that we started, that we initiated here, that was highly influential and resonated around the globe, perhaps. One thing you can you, you you can take away from this period and and sort of the major movements and events and figures is after the Second World War. I mean, San Francisco was always a little bit of a distant outpost, and and the the sort of artistic achievements that you see in painting, photography, sculpture, uh, theater, music, especially psychedelic posters. Um, almost always comes from a very small, vibrant, collaborative, do-it-yourself culture. And that's one thing you can say about the San Francisco Renaissance, you can say it about um, the hippies, and it's one of the things that I think are notable is that nobody was waiting around for some sort of official invitation to do something, that instead what you got were people that just did it, you know, sometimes without a lot of patronage, or support, they got their friends together and they started working on something that, that they got energy mm -hmm. from. And I, I, think that's, I think that's an important aspect of, of this region's culture. Mm -hmm. 
and that, that needs to be reinforced because uh, you don't get a permission slip to do these things. Mm -hmm. You just have to get together with your friends and start doing it. There you go. So if it's one major lesson to take away from the 60s counterculture in San Francisco, DIY. Don't wait for someone else. Make Very it much happen. so, yeah. Uh, the hippies clearly had issues with their government and politics. We clearly today have issues with our government and politics. Is there anything we can learn from the political agenda of the people at that mm. time that we might apply more, more effectively today than they did? Yeah. I'm a historian, so I'm not always great on the what do we do now questions, yeah. but I'd say two things that I think a lot about. The first is that a lot of people in, in, uh, who participated in the Summer of Love actually had a, quite a wide range of political beliefs. Some were, came from, well, some were red diaper babies who came from you know, parents who'd been in the Communist Party and been blacklisted. But others were libertarians and, mm -hmm. and conservative in some ways. And I think one of the really important things about let's, you know, the politics of, of the Summer of Love was that it was a universalist politics. And it was about trying to um, connect with people across differences. All right, we might have different political beliefs and we're going to argue about them and talk about them, but that doesn't mean we also can't find common ground where we can um, do things together to, you know, that... Um, in terms of community. So there's a kind of communitarian politics that we might try to recover. And, you know, that means that these, in a way, we think of the counterculture and the summer of love as being about, like, violating civility. You know, people were running naked in the streets. But I think there was an awful lot of fellowship and kindness and people trying to actually be quite civil with each other. <laughs> well, and you have diggers with free stores and free food, and, yeah. and then you had just the, the flower children giving away flowers, right. even money on the street. Yeah, and I think it's like one of the things that we might take from the Summer of Love is their combination of gentleness and toughness, right? This is a, this is a scene where people are trying to figure out how do you combine those two? How do you, how do you how do you be gentle with people without being a fool? Yeah, and getting, get walked all over. Getting and, taken yeah. advantage yeah. of. How do you have a strong ego, but in, in the positive sense? But, but how do you also stay open and not turn just kind of cynical and hard-edged mm -hmm. about things? And I think there's something about that. It's like th there was a sensibility that they were trying to work through that we might try to um, keep in mind or bring or model or, or try to experiment with given just how divisive everything is now culturally between people uh, in America and in the world. So that's one thing that I think, why does, the, why does the summer of love matter in our winter of discontent now? <laughs> is um, there's a sensibility, there's a way to think about being a citizen, there's a way to think about being a person that combines gentleness and um, toughness in a way that we might really try to harness and bring, bring out more. And, and I think the second thing about, um, about the Summer of Love that matters now is, um, is, that, uh, is that politics needs a culture, right? That, that you know, there's, if you're a person, let's say, of what we now think of as the left or liberals and you, you, you want the, um, uh, the world to move in better directions in terms of climate change, in terms of rights for um, being widely um, received among different people, if you want the world to have more social justice, um, uh, more access to um, uh, a sense of abundance and possibility in the world, if you long for these things now, um, you know, you can go to the barricades, and there may be times when we need now to go to the barricades and march and and, and be um, aggressively political and vote and you know, the whole range of political activity. But that needs to sit in a cultural life. Um, and, and, and it needs a, a place where we can go to recharge ourselves, to, to feel whole, to find fellowship and community, and to um, welcome others to it. And I think um, it's that cultural project that, that, the, that some aspects of the Summer of Love was about. Not just so this is a little different. It's not just that if you change your mind and change consciousness, the world will change. I don't know, maybe. But I think more so that 
we need to be active political citizens, but we also need to have a culture that we can sit that political activism in, where we feel like life has a richness and a sense of worth to it. And, and I think the Summer of Love got really interested in that. How do you build a community? How do you build a neighborhood? How do you make a commune? Um, what works? What doesn't? Um, what comes up in those, ish in those places around gender equality and who gets to go and who doesn't and how do we try to tackle these issues? So again, it's like, okay, a lot of the communes failed. A lot of the neighborhoods had trouble. They met up against all kinds of problems. But that the spirit of trying to build a robust, humane culture um, in which we practice politics. I think that's a real lesson that the Summer of Love can um, carry down to our struggles now in the contemporary moment. You're saying the counterculture presented that new challenge. Absolutely. Right. In every way. Non-defined roles Not and a, hierarchy and look certain, at this. Yeah. Look at this. Gay, transgender, right? It's no longer, you know, LB, LGBTQ, you know, it's now like there's 30 letters, right? You know, and we want to respect and embrace it and acknowledge it and validate everyone, of course, but it gets a little tricky, cumbersome. Yes, cumbersome. Another way of putting cumbersome is to say challenging. Namely, we're going to learn how to live together in ways that nobody has ever learned to live together before. What a cause. Isn't that great? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, that's what life is about. Yeah negotiating our lives every day. Yes. That's what freedom is. And it's always evolving and changing, so it's adaptation and adjustment anyway. That's right, but that's freedom. That's yes. real freedom, yeah. which America promised and never gave. It's real freedom because every day we decide who we're gonna be and how we're gonna do it. It's kind of it's kind of a beautiful thing. It's what great, great art comes out of. I mean, sitting before a page and deciding what to write or a music score or sitting with an instrument. I mean, we all become creative and creators of the kinds of lives we want to live. So that's the counterculture. Mm -hmm. How do we use what we're now learning and exposed to from the counterculture to help us find a way forward through some of the challenges that we face in society? I, I think the counterculture is in some essence a really hopeful period in the United States. Mm -hmm. In so much as, if you look at the social conditions of let's say 1968, it was a hard world. Injustice, racism, we could go on and on, right? The war in Vietnam, tearing literally people's limbs apart. So it's not like those were the days and everything was sweet, but people challenged those unpleasantnesses, those dangers, those horrors. And, and I think, again, the counterculture is a reminder, you don't have to accept the terms of your existence as they were handed down to you. So I think that's, that's the enduring lesson of that period of time.